Welcome everyone. It's such a thrill to have you here to talk about 10 years of boot camp and 10 years of policy advocacy and what the role that chefs play in really changing the food system. So just so thrilled to be sharing this table with you for a little bit. And I'd love for you all to introduce yourself and tell us your name and your restaurant. I'm uh, Katie Button and um, I have two restaurants in Asheville, North Carolina, Curate and uh, La Bodega by Curate. Very nice. I'm Tiffany Derry, and I am the chef and owner of Root Southern Table in Farmer's Branch, which is Dallas, the suburbs, <laughs> and uh, Plano, Texas, and Austin, Texas for Root Chicken Shack. I'm Rick Bayless. Um, I own a bunch of restaurants in Chicago, and um, we call it the Frontera Group after the very first of the restaurants that we established here. My name is Hugo Ortega, and I'm with H Town Restaurant Group, and Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm Greg Collier, and I'm chef and owner of a Bay Haven restaurant group. My wife, Sabrina, and one of the co-founders of Bay Haven Food and Wine Festival in Charlotte, North Carolina. Appreciate you So what has the biggest impact on your career been of having attended boot camp? And you've all attended a number of years ago. Um, so whoever wants to take it first, what difference has a boot camp made in your life? I think that it, you know, gave me something bigger to strive for, like an understanding that my work isn't just about the four walls of our restaurants and the guests and the food that we serve and those memories that we create for people that we actually have the power to create long lasting industry change. And that's just something that you can fight for for your life. Yeah. Something so much bigger than yourself. And I feel like when you are in your restaurants and you're working day to day and you kind of just start focusing in and being a part of boot camp just really opened my eyes to many other things that um, I could use and lend my voice to that matter. And I think that's important for me. That was personally important for me to be a part of something that would not only be just for me, but for generations to come. Mm -hmm. I've always really been interested since we first opened Frontera Grill in changing the food system, but I wanted to do it from the inside. Like I wanted to vote with my dollars that I was spending, um, supporting small farmers and supporting people that were doing things the right way. And when I went to boot camp, um, I've never been a very political person, and so boot camp sort of put me into the policy stuff. And I, I won't say that I was changed to, to become super political after that, but I felt like at least I had the tools. Mm -hmm. And when push came to shove during the pandemic, and we actually had to advocate for ourselves at a policy level, I felt like that I had the tools to be able to do that. I wasn't afraid of it. Mm. Yeah, that's important to not be afraid, to, to get some confidence, confidence yes. right, that you Absolutely. can do it. And, yeah. Uh, for me, it was a learning experience, and like Rick say, I feel very uncomfortable when I talk about politics. And um, when I, I was very confused during during a boot camp. However, when I came back, it gave me the opportunity to fight for what we think is the right thing to do. And I've been uh, in contact with the Gulf conservancy for to save red snapper mm -hmm. um, and then uh, as I went over your questions the homework that you gave <laughs> us <laughs> try to understand and understand I say to myself I mean during the pandemic and after it put us upside down and when that happened you try to get provisions you know from the uh, the purveyors that you used to get, and it was not that easy. Mm -hmm. So the local people were available, and the a little bit that we can get from the markets, you know, that gave you the answer that what we fight is not just on what we're cooking, but it's beyond that. So, but I'd like to leave that to big personalities like Rick, and oh. uh, you know, I will be behind him, support him all the way. <laughs> But I think it's so important to, to fight for the, for the right things. Yeah. I don't know, man. Like, I think um, 
I've, I've always, you know, as a black chef, I've always just tried to figure out what I can do for my community. Um, and I think there's so many different things that um, underserved communities deal with. So I didn't know what to, what I'm supposed to be doing, how am I supposed to um, handle all these things. But I think going to boot camp kind of gave me a focus. That's the first time I really heard the word uh, food desert. And once I really understand about food desert and what No Kid Hungry does, I kind of was like, oh, that's the thing. That's the thing right there, food insecurity. After the boot camp, we decided to open um, a restaurant in a food desert. Like our, our restaurant is in 28206 in Charlotte, and it's one of the poorest neighborhoods in Charlotte. Um, we just were able to be a part of a community that was developing. And it's, you know, folks have been living there as historically African-American neighborhood, but it's a lot of people coming in. So I think Sabrina and I, outside of trying to fight food insecurity and figure out ways we could donate to those local charities to do that, I think just being that bridge, uh, that gap bridge, so to speak. Like we do a certain kind of food or people in the neighborhood can get it, but the people who are coming in the neighborhood can get it too. And both of those people in the restaurant at the same time. So I think like coming to the boot camp allowed me to see a clear focus, a clear thing that I could do um, from a restaurant perspective. So mm. it was amazing. And that's what I think, you know, like I learned at boot camp is you right. harness the thing yep. that drives yep. you, right. yep. mm -hmm. right. you know, and it can be anything. Yep. Sure. Like there's so much change and good that needs mm -hmm. to happen in the world that you find that thing like you did with yep. the food desert piece. You find that thing yep. that sparks you and inspires you and then that's your drive and fire to make change happen. Yep. And I feel like it becomes so authentic when you figure out what you want to do and where your piece is. For me, it was food waste. And that was the area that resonated best with me and, and understanding food waste, but still realizing there's hunger. And like, how do we, like, how does that exist? Uh, yeah, and then yeah. you hear the numbers, you're like, wait a minute, right? It's and crazy. <laughs> it's just out of control. Yeah. And when we make people a little bit more aware of those numbers, people look at things a little different when we talk about it, because sometimes we just don't talk about it enough. Like there's so much happening. There's so many bad policies. There's so much waste happening, but it's not in the forefront. So therefore people aren't thinking about it, right? When you ask anyone, you know, about waste, when you're like, how much do you waste? And they're like, oh, I don't waste a lot, you know? And they, it, no, we all do, yeah. you know? And um, I think just putting it forefront is so important. And so it's interesting, especially, you know, Ugo and, and Rick, you say you, you're not political, you were not, at least before going. What made you want to attend? What was the, yes, I'm, I'm taking that trip, I'm taking yeah, this Yeah, so I had the opportunity to sit down with, um, I guess, the advocate for sport fishing. And I was a little bit confused, you know, English is not my first language, so I get a little bit in trouble sometimes. <laughs> so, but um, anyway, they tried to, at some point, they tried to, uh, the, the great Huachinango, the red snapper, to be used as sport fishing. And, mm -hmm. and like one person can go over there and catch four or five or, you know, six or eight or ten, and nobody's checking on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we are, you know, we, um, the red snapper that we get sometimes even come with a tag. And, you know, we try to make sure the give it the value they represent to us. It's, it's almost a mythical fish, you know, the, our ancestors, they used to um, bring fresh fish to Cuauhtémoc, or to Cuauhtémoc from the Gulf, and they have runners, they run the, the fresh catch, which was Huachinango to a certain point, and they, they took it, and they said in the history of the Cuauhtémoc, a the you know fresh huachinango so it's a mythical thing that we defend and so when when I had the opportunity to say I don't think that adding that you as a sports person you want just for a sport ways to have the snapper and then eliminate that of the food chain for us you know and anyway it was very interesting and. I don't think that person came back to the restaurant anymore. But <laughs> I, I made my point, and we, yeah. we, we, you know, we go from there. So, yeah. I wanted to go because I'm naturally curious, <laughs> and so I love learning things. And I wanted to spend a few days with people that were very deeply into the political side of things, creating policy, and all that sort of thing. And um, I wouldn't say that it changed me a ton, 
though I have had to use it over the last couple of years, but it didn't change me a ton because um, I've always been interested in, in changing our system <laughs> because we work in a pretty broken system. Mm -hmm. And just as you said, that we have all this waste and we have all this hunger, okay? And we have all of this very, very processed food that's going out. And especially in the food deserts, what, what can people get? Usually it's stuff at a corner store, and that's all they can get, which you'd be lucky if you found an orange and a banana right. in those kind of places. Right. It's mostly just processed food. And we all know that our health depends on us eating well, right? Not eating a ton of processed food. Right. So we have made this system that just keeps people who live in those food deserts down because they can't get good nutrition. And to me, um, I want to figure out ways that we can support the it's sort of in some ways outside of the political system and support change because I'm a person that doesn't like to take no for an answer for anything. So if the system tells me no, I'm going to figure out a way to get to yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that in so many ways, that's what all of us small business owners do because there's always huge obstacles in our way. And if we can figure out ways around those obstacles, we can actually make a difference in our communities, which it sounds like all of us are really interested in doing. And of course, the boot camp can give us the kinds of, well, not only that, that sort of political side of it, but actually getting to know other chefs that have mm -hmm. like minds. Yeah. And I will say that that's one of the things that I took away from it was just yeah. having conversations with people that came from all over the, the country and that we're all doing our own thing in the way that we do it, right? The sharing of the information was yes, fantastic. It was fantastic. You know, you, you you could come and say, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, and there's someone else at the boot camp who's done it or has the yes. experience, and now all of a sudden there's this synergy that's happening yeah. that's very hard to describe. I, I don't know if you remember the meal that we were oh paired up and we cooked. Yes. And how fun it was to get to know another chef that I didn't know at all. And he was from uh, from Hawaii. And it was like we were talking. I was like, oh, you do that. Oh, well, what if we, what if we do these things together? So we... The, what boot camp gave us was the opportunity to create a playing field where we were all there and we could sort of relate to each other because what we love to do is cook, okay? And so it's like to be able to cook together with other people um, gave me the opportunity to get to know some other people in a way that I could trust them in. It was super deep really fast. Yes, it was. I think, man, for me, I just, <laughs> I'm be honest, I didn't know it was policy involved. I just knew it was chefs, <laughs> and I knew we were not going to be at work. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, man, sign me up for this. And if they're going to take me on this trip, I want to do it. Yes. So when when we found when I found out it was policy involved, and when I found out um, for ours specifically was food insecurity. So I was real fortunate to be in the one that that was talking about the thing that was most passionate for me. So the original was just like, y'all want to go hang out with uh, chefs. I didn't know we were going to cook any of that. So once I found out that, I was like, oh, gravy, whipped cream, cherries. Like all these things <laughs> was just extra for me. But being able to be in a space with people of like minds, like y'all talked about, cooking together, talking together, yeah. sharing great stories, sharing tough stories. Yeah. Hey, how, how are you dealing with this? You know, this is coming in our city. I was coming to your city to have those conversations. It was just super dope. And I think I left not only with um, like a breadth of information and knowledge, but I left with friends and people I've done dinners with and people I've planned to do dinners with later on. So it was just a great experience and from just the camaraderie part, mm -hmm. the policy yeah. that we learned and you know, learning how to change certain things in our community was just extra. Yeah. How was that dinner experience for you, Katie? Because that's such a big piece of it. It was amazing. I was definitely nervous. Like, you know, when you get paired up with <laughs> other is. chefs in community, it's like, you're like, oh gosh, like now I gotta show what I can do here. <laughs> 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 I gotta, like, stack. What if our dish sucks? <laughs> yeah, totally. But then you realize, you know, in this community that everybody is feeling the yep. exact exactly. same way yeah. and is having those like butterflies about cooking for your colleagues, you know, the, the chefs that you admire and like work with and are connecting. So then it like settles down and becomes fun. <clears throat> and it was it was a blast. Like I think the the camaraderie was the biggest piece. We're so busy in our businesses, like in the day in, day out, that it you don't have the opportunity 
to connect and get to know one another and understand that we all care about the same things, mm -hmm. you know, are like passionate about the same things and have so much in common mm -hmm. that finding that community, I don't know, it can feel very isolating in the restaurant industry. Sure. And so the boot camp was really about eliminating that feeling of yeah. being isolated, mm -hmm. you know? So I loved it. Are you still in touch with some of the people you were at boot camp with? Oh, for sure. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. I'm trying to, uh, we're kind of in the process of trying to figure out how to uh, do some chef dinners together. Mm. We've kind of obviously, uh, ours came right before the pandemic. Mm. And we all kind of was like, all right, we're going to do this in June. We're going to do this in July. And then pandemic happened. I was like, we're going to survive first. <laughs> yeah. So once we once we survive and we figure out this thing, we're going to do more. But absolutely, we text often, email, Instagram mm -hmm. a lot with each other. So for sure, for sure. That's, that's uh, my chef family. Yeah. And Tiffany, when we were talking before uh, starting, you were talking about, you were about to tell us about the animal experience at yes, boot camp, and yes. you wanted to share that, so. Yes, Chef Rick and I were both at mm -hmm. this area. What was the? Glenwood. Glenwood. And there was a butcher that was gonna happen, and we were going to do a kill. And, mm -hmm. you know, you say that word, and it just feels strong. Mm -hmm. And I remember Michelle, and I remember Adam, the butcher, mm -hmm. setting it up, and he was, you know, telling us to, you know, calm your breath. Mm -hmm. And we were really quiet, mm -hmm. and there was there was even a poem that was read right. by someone. <laughs> and I mean, when I tell you, it felt spiritual in a way that you could only experience in the moment. There was stillness in the air, and everyone mm -hmm. was just waiting. And we were kind of off where you couldn't see the animal, couldn't see us. Mm -hmm. um, and it just happened so quickly. Um, and I mean, it was it was like seconds mm -hmm. it happened, and we all had an opportunity to you know go through sort of the the area, the parts of the animal, and get in there if you want to learn. And you know, if you've never done it, it was nice. There were a lot of chefs that had never seen a kill before, so it was you know it was this experience that I will remember forever. It was the energy in the building, the way that you respect it what we were now about to cook, right? Yes. Because our meal was based off of what we were breaking down. And I'll never forget just going, oh my gosh, we have to honor every piece of so everything true. that we're doing. So true. And I remember choosing the liver yes. because it yes. was the leftover yeah, one. Yeah. And I was like, I want the liver. And yeah. so I was like, are you sure? I'm like, yes. Um, but it was it was an incredible experience. And it was, it, it really, it, it came together in the word sacrifice to mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. And I think about the way that Native Americans used to go out for their kills and they would always say a blessing before they would. And this sort of was what it was like. And after I came back from that experience, I, I started um, on a yearly basis taking um, all of our top staff, our kitchen staff, um, to the fellow that provides all of our pork because he has his own processing plant there. And so that they could experience it. It wasn't, you know, it's not as spiritual an experience as what sure. we shared at book, boot camp, but it was, it's always still, because it, it's very small, um, this is the animal. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is the animal we're sacrificing for us to be able to use. And when you say you you really respect every part of the animal, once you go through a, a kill like that, you really respect every part of the animal. You don't throw anything away. Absolutely. I'm gonna tell you something, the wildest thing about the experience for me. Like the lead up to it was crazy. Walking up the hill was crazy. Hearing the animal, understanding we were there was crazy. The craziest part was like, so the animal died, whatever, and some of us, like you were saying, actually touched the animal and got in there and did some stuff. The trigger of feeling warm meat when yeah. every time in my whole life it's been cold, it's gotta be cold, it's supposed to be cold, it's supposed to be refrigerated, kind of just shocked me into understanding how this process works. And I know we know how it works, we've broken down animals and all those things, but putting your hand inside of a pelt of a warm animal and being like, wow, yeah. mm -hmm. we're about to cook that? Mm -hmm. was. There's something else. It's a whole nother thing. Some of you have mentioned already the fact that whether you were doing advocacy or not in, 20, in February 2020, by March 2020, <laughs> you were doing serious <laughs> advocacy, right, for your industry. Yes. Katie, let's start with you because you were very early and very heavily uh, all over Instagram. I remember seeing very powerful videos of you advocating for the industry. So 
What, what is some of the work that you did and how did that feel for you to be advocating so powerfully? It felt um, like the only thing that I had control over and could do in the moment. It was like everything, we weren't sure if everything was closing, we just shut down, laid off all of our workers, like lost all any money and more and we're looking at like a pile of debt that had no idea how we were ever gonna get out of it. And then the policy that was being created, it was like in the beginning, the way that you know the PPP program things were structured in the beginning, it was like they totally forgot about the industry that was being most impacted, um, who depends on people gathering in close quarters to be alive, <laughs> you know, to function and survive. And so it, it just was this moment of like, we have to do this, otherwise everything goes away. And that was really powerful, but really looking at what um, we had learned at the boot camp, it's harnessing the power of being a chef and a restaurant owner and starting to understand that you have connections with the public. Pub the public loves restaurants. They love chefs. They love those experiences and memories that they have when they dine in your places. And then also you have the whole connection to the supply chain, all of the food people that you purchase from, the farmers, they also love and depend on the restaurant industry. And so being able to speak and harness kind of the, the collective power of those two groups to then put in the face of the politicians what is really happening, because they don't know, they're not in the industry, right? They, you understand that they don't understand what's actually happening all the time until you tell them. Yes. And then it takes all of us like getting together to show them and teach them. I remember talking in early conversations with you know, senators or their aides and being like, this is the restaurant business model. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like. This is what happens when it shuts down. And this is what my bank accounts currently look like in the stack of bills. How are we gonna get out of this mess? And this is what PPP currently does. And it was really, really wonderful. And I realized that you know, reaching out to our chef community to activate together mm -hmm. is very powerful. I mean, it's maybe one of the largest, biggest potential of grassroots efforts right. that we could possibly ever do to change anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do think about the restaurant industry in terms of, you know, big chain fast food places and everything. But no, the real, the reality of the restaurant industry is it's all of these individual restaurants, a lot of mom and pa owned places that really are contributing so much to their neighborhoods. And I grew up in one of those small ma and pa restaurants, and it was really doing something for that community where we had that restaurant. And we supported all of the, the softball teams and the, the kids things that they were doing at school, and they all came in and it was like, we were a community center as well as just a place to go and eat food. And when all the restaurants were shut down, I know that growing up in that restaurant, it was very fragile. It didn't have a lot of reserves. And so if I, that restaurant had been shut down, my mother retired after 37 years and sold the business to somebody else. But if that restaurant that I grew up in had been shut down during the pandemic this way, it would never have made it. It just couldn't have made it because it was, it just constantly was on the on the brink of, we made a few dollars this, this month or we lost a few dollars this month. So so I, for me, I really wanted to advocate for all of those small businesses because those are the fabric of communities. What is some of the advocacy work that you, have, that you did specifically for industry support, would you say? Um, when it came time for um, us to step up, it felt gut-wrenching, right? Um, I, I remember their feeling very well. Years ago, many years ago, after Top Chef, so we're talking about 14 years ago, um, I was a part of a restaurant group that closed. And the feeling of that, like looking your people in the eyes and no longer and telling them that they no longer have a job, it, it, it shook me in a way I had never been shook before. So when pandemic happened, oh my God, seriously, I'm not gonna be emotional. I felt this overwhelming 
sense of like, you're gonna lose it all. Yeah. Everything you've worked so hard for. And so in that, I decided that, not today. <laughs> this is not the way I'm gonna go out. Uh -huh. And I just knew that I had to, I had to go back to the community. I had to be a part of the community. I had to make sure that we all were gonna be okay. I didn't go policy in that way, but I just wanted to make sure that the people who support us have a meal, that they're no longer, they're off from work, we're all off from work. They don't even have a, a bite to eat. The grocery stores are out of food. Everyone has no food. Here I am with the refrigerator full, and I'm like, the one thing I can do right now is I can cook. And when I started cooking, I never stopped. I remember the very first one was me taking the money we had going to the store and buying food and selling. At that moment, we weren't selling. We were just giving it away. Mm -hmm. And then people started seeing what we were doing. Other companies, organizations, and they were like, how can we help? We want to be a part of it. Large corporations. And next thing you know, we're you know feeding city workers. We're feeding anyone who needs a meal. And then we started doing, you know, all of the family meals, but very, very early on. And I knew that I wanted to provide a meal that was nourishment for everyone outside of just making money. Mm -hmm. And so I priced it really low. A family of four could have a salad, an entree, and sometimes dessert, and sometimes they would throw in a bottle of wine, and we would give that um, to those families. But it was so important for me to just take care of everyone around me. And at the end of the day, that took a toll as well because here we are trying to save the businesses, trying to save everyone else. And in a way, I felt like I was slightly drowning by the time, you know? And so that moment, as you can see, is still one of those things that, that um, drives me. And I think for my team, they were able to see what we can do when we do it together. The other restaurants around us, everyone just got together and it was this moment of like, if we just do it together, we can survive, you know? And it was, it was a moment that I've never seen before, obviously, and even our neighborhoods, our communities. After, after all of that moment, they started, when they got on their feet, they came back to us. Mm -hmm. You know, we went to a moment of having to let go a lot of people and, and cut hours to a moment where we were hiring people. We didn't have enough. And so it's just, it's like if you take care of people, people will take care of you. Absolutely. And if we were pure in our intentions and it was authentic and it was the right thing to do, and it just showed that you'll be all right if you just continue to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Ugo and Greg, what about you? What no are more. some of the ways in which you either so I got So I got to go after, 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 Tiffany? after that yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, I, I, oh. So in a lot of ways, we kind of dealt with some similar things. Um, it was tough to it was tough to know what to do. It was tough to figure out what to do. One of the first things we did were breakfast, lunches, and dinners for um, certain communities. And like we partnered with some people locally to do that. But I think the... I think the thing that hit me the most about the pandemic, for one, our restaurant opened or was supposed to open the day they made the announcement to go from 50 to 10. We had just got done with friends and family and that Wednesday mm -hmm. was gonna be our first day. So they made the announcement Monday. So it was kind of like, everybody was like, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? It was like, yeah, we're just gonna do to go, whatever. But I think at home, Sabrina and I were both trying to figure out what we actually were gonna do. Um, and then we, we kind of, you know, did to-goes, did family meals, paid up as much as our staff as we could. We got funding when we could get funding, and we kind of, you know, made it to the next step. But I think the thing that got me the most was closing the restaurants made me realize how bad the restaurant system was, like how bad we For were sure. operating. Like I never thought about it. I was one of those chefs um, who was kind of like, I had to go through what I had to go through to become me and I you need to go through struggle kind of thing and stopping and not working made me realize how valuable being at home was. Not having to worry about who's coming in and who's not coming in made me very conscious that 
You're supposed to like what you do for a living. And if you don't like what you do for a living, you're not going to do it. So not even from a policy perspective, just from a, well, not directly from a policy perspective, just we really looked at the restaurant model and insurance shouldn't be a thing we're having a conversation about. Having a 401k shouldn't be a thing we're having a conversation about. People working a regular five day, eight hour a day week shouldn't be a thing we're having a conversation about. Sure is tough, sure is trying to figure out how you're gonna put people in place, but I never really thought about the restaurant system in that way, even though I've struggled, even though I've had to deal with certain things, I never really thought it was that bad. When that happened and we had to take a look at what we were doing outside of like top down policy from a governmental perspective, you know, it, it made us change the way we ran the restaurant. We added a service fee, Everybody on this team has the opportunity to get health insurance to 401k, even at the loss of our bottom line and our profits. And because of that, we've kind of built a place where a lot of people want to come. We don't have a high turnover rate. Our leaders are our leaders. I don't have to be at the restaurants. So we don't have to be at the restaurant. So it, it, it was, it was uh, the silver line in the cloud for sure. Hugo, what about you? Is there any... It, changes you made then that you're still de making? definitely i mean there is before and after right mm -hmm. and um, the difficult thing is that when they make the announcement that you need to close your restaurant for two weeks and is this two what it happens in <laughs> in houston <laughs> we did not know that for example sochi at downtown uh, which is served with hacking food uh, we got up it was open for i mean i'm sorry we got to close for nine months yeah. before we can reopen because the downtown people don't want to come back to work. And then the equation got pretty difficult. Um, we uh, gathered up and, you know, it was countless nights of um, trying to figure out how we want to do it or, or how this is going to work. And we went from there. We have um, five restaurants and it's, it was a challenge. Um, so it definitely changed the industry forever, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, also make us realize how, um, uh, I would say, uh, how fragile it is, you know, from uh, everything. Go as mm -hmm. uh, many of you mentioned, your daily life. And then the next day you have to fight for I mean, at that point, we have around 400 employees, and today we have around 180. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we regroup how to, you know, keep close some lunches and uh, restaurants. They are now close to a shopping center or so on. And anyway, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it was pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure for all of us it was difficult. But I think lots of people made some changes. I don't know. We we made major changes <laughs> here. Not only just looking at the business more as a where where do we make our money, but like we we went from the regular tipped model to paying everybody um, a, a salary and the putting the the service charge on so that we could create. A more stable environment where everyone can thrive, not just a few people on the staff could thrive. And I felt like that because we were able to come to a full stop during the pandemic, we actually had the choice or the opportunity to make choices that would be really good choices for the for us for the future. In other words, taking that broken model and trying to make it a little bit less broken and make it what I think is a more professional thing because it's like when, when you know that half your staff is really working for those people that are at the table because they're working for tips and they're, they're more like mercenaries in a way that are out there for themselves or whatever. But now I feel like that we're all one team <laughs> and everybody is working for the same end, which is to, to make sure that those guests have a really wonderful time, good food, good service, and everything. But we're so much more of a, a single unit than I think feel like that we have ever been. And I'm 
really thankful that we got to come to that full stop and then reopen in a way that I've been wanting to do for a long time, but I don't think we could have ever done it if we hadn't come to that full stop. So I'm super happy about that part. Are there, so you've all made changes at the individual level, right? But is there also um, an opportunity and have you worked for changes at the leg legislative level, right? Because there's also certain states where, in New York you can't tip yes, poll, for right, example, right, right, right? right? So are you working with that? Are you still having these conversation with lawmakers? Are you trying to do systematic change? Something wonderful happened. Um, in Texas, I think they allow us to sell wine, right? Sure, yes, that's a go. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yay, we to go that cocktails in my changing right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was we, a little rope. We, right. we got that here in Chicago as well. Which that, that, yes. that definitely yeah. helped, right? Yes, yes, it was a big help, yes. 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 Yeah, we really advocated very strongly for that and it did get, go through and we were really happy about mm -hmm. that. I'm ready to begin advocating for change in uh, tipping policies and um, uh, you know minimum wage rates and all of that. The past couple of years has been so much pandemic policy and relief focused yeah. okay. that it's it's just absorbed every single bit of any advocacy work that, yeah. that, you know that I think a lot of us are doing. And now I, I feel like hope you know as we're shifting into the kind of current state of foreverness of things, you know, mm -hmm. that it that it's beginning to feel like time to start heading back, knocking on some of those doors. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I, healthcare. Healthcare. <laughs> healthcare. Yes. Oh <laughs> that to me is where we've got to start. Just like you were saying, is that there's no reason that the restaurant industry should be so different than other industries, right. and that we just need we need healthcare. I think the boot camp, like the thing about it is that it gives you the one understanding that you can change the atmosphere and policy in any of these areas, whether it's food, wages, healthcare, like, and also gives you kind of that courage and conviction and something to tie yourself to for the long run mm -hmm. that is very fulfilling as an individual. Yeah you know, that I think is really one of the most attractive pieces about getting into it. One of the things that I was really nervous about was talking to our legislators. <laughs> and when I finally realized that it's actually their job to listen to us, <laughs> then I had a little more courage to be able to go and say, this is important, This need you need to follow up on this, you need to, to vote yes for this thing that is going to make a difference in the lives of many, many people. When I got to that point, I, and I think that boot camp gave me a lot of the tools to do it, but I was still nervous. And it really wasn't until the pandemic that I just started calling up and talking about, could I have a meeting with that person? Because their job is to listen to me. And I think that's a really important thing for, I think, everybody in our industry to know that we, we can have a voice. We do have a voice. Greg, are you doing some of that? Some of these things beyond your restaurant? Was um, not, we haven't really dug into the policy piece yet. Um, I know we're both in North Carolina, Katie, and it's a lot of different things that I think um, need to change and need some work. Um, tipping, trying to figure out um, how the service model works, all those things. Um, there, was, there was talk, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was talk about trying to do a community health insurance um, from a, like a really high level that I think kind of, like you're saying, happened like it was real strong during the pandemic but we didn't keep pushing i'm i'm kind of ready to get back onto that because like working for everybody else i worked at a hotels or whatever we just had health insurance mm -hmm. so not having it you know it really don't matter when you're 22 and you're doing everything wrong to your body and you're still good when you get <laughs> when you start to get a little older yes. and you wake up in the morning and you need to go to the doctor health insurance is super important so trying to advocate for that is probably something that we're going to be doing in the next couple of years mm -hmm. What's one thing you would say to someone who you know, has not gone through boot camp, might not get through a boot camp, to get the courage and the confidence to call their, law, their lawmaker, their legislature? What is one thing that you have found helpful? Or Just to do it. Yeah. Just to actually pick up the phone and, and call, even if you're getting a recorded message and you can still leave a message for people, that it actually does make a difference. Believing that? Yes. That you would be surprised 
how few steps it takes to get to your senator's office yes. from your community. Mm -hmm. Like, because people love restaurants, mm -hmm. and when you start reaching out to your bankers or community members, the people who are dining in your restaurants and asking them who has a connection to this person, it's amazing how quickly, like two steps, and you can be on a phone call with you know the, an aides team of your senator's office. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think it's important for people who are kind of worried or afraid to kind of reach out to these people. We're community leaders in all our communities. Mm -hmm. um, like we make our communities look good. Mm -hmm. In return, the people who lead our communities should also help us when we need help. And I think that's a really important thing. Like whatever we're representing, we go to places and we're talking about these places they have a responsibility to us to make sure we have what we need so we can continue representing these communities. If we don't have these restaurants, how would we be able to do that? So I think, you know, it's a, it's a you know, together uh, communication. So I think we could do it together and they need to know, hey, look, if y'all wants to do this for y'all, y'all need to make sure y'all do this for us. So. Yeah, I mean, especially when they're when they're up for election. And Absolutely. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody's all ears. Um, to the and I think it's dinner. after they're elected, we need to hold their feet to the yeah. fire. Yeah. It's we, we need yeah. to hold them accountable. Um, and we just need to be bold in it, you know, and stop with the, you know, I don't know. I'm just one. No, we are important. We matter. Our, our businesses matter and our businesses serve so many. And when like we've talked about the chain that our businesses um, service is is important, and I think we just we we just have to stand up for ourselves. Yeah, and what you just said, we're just one. I mean, it's it's so not true. You mm. represent thousands and you thousands do. of people. Yeah. Yes, right? yeah. yes. It's just important for you to understand your power. I think before boot camp, I didn't really understand that I had some power. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, mm -hmm. I felt like I was a restaurant. I felt like you know I'm a chef. And after it's like okay, after you do that one, you know, you take that one step and you have that one meeting and then it's like, wait a minute, they're just normal people too. And they, they actually have to hear me, right? You know, take your notes, write it down. I'll follow up with the email, you know? <laughs> um, but I think that just sort of boot camp, it got you prepared, but you also have to make some steps after that, right? You have to figure out where you wanna be, what you wanna do and, and start working on that back home. Yeah. I think that um, we all suffer from the fact that the narrative about working in a restaurant in our country is that it's the lowest job you can have. And I think pre-pandemic, I even ha held that in my head. And post-pandemic, I'm not taking that anymore. I want to change that narrative. I don't want to hear the late night comedians using restaurant workers as the butts of their jokes. I don't want people to always say, well, I would want my kid to work in anything but a restaurant, you right. know, that right. kind of stuff. No, we do really, really good work in our communities and we have to stand up and, and take that, embrace that fully. Because like you said, we're community leaders. Yeah. People actually see us co as community leaders and not somebody that's just at the lowest, in the lowest rungs right. of, of our society. Absolutely. I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my new thing. It's like, I'm changing the narrative. I'm out there, I'm, I'm advocating for changing the narrative yeah. about what we do and what we contribute because I think it's incredibly important. How do you get your diners to embrace what you believe in? Oh, uh, listen, uh, my wife's not in here, uh, but I'll speak she for her. She can hear you. Uh, <laughs> she is um, very um, principle driven, and she is also very, they'll get it eventually. Um, I think we just, we changed things because the goal was to be good to the people we served, and the goal was to be even better for the people who uh, help us make our money and help us uh, build our name. So, like with the service fee, for instance, we did it. And there was a bunch of blowback, a bunch of articles about, oh, we're doing this, we're doing that. Now in Charlotte, everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. You got places that do it to go food to do a service fee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we got a lot of emails, hey, how are y'all doing this? What's going on? Like, what do y'all, how do y'all feel about it? We were one of the first ones to actually do it in Charlotte, and we kind of took uh, the brunt of the public eye for that. But now it's commonplace and it's normal. So I think that's one of those things, uh, you know, Sabrina is very strong in that way to say, 
this is the right thing to do. It's gonna make our restaurant better. It's gonna make the community better. And it's gonna make sure our employees are at a place to where they're comfortable with saying, I'll commit this week to you. I'll commit these hours to you because I know you're gonna commit to me. So I think, you know, c the customers who really care about what you're trying to do will always get it and they'll keep coming back because they care about what you're trying to do. They know how important it is to have the living ways. They know how important it is to have the 401k because they've had it in all their careers. So mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing. Just like your customers will always understand what you're doing. The people who don't probably won't gonna come anyway. Mm -hmm. Are there specific strategies that you guys use to communicate with your diners? From menu, on menu, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. website, you know, we've seen over the last, you know, year, um, I like looking at sort of what tech has to offer. And I think that um, it's important for us to embrace that part of it, whether that be understanding the consumers, understanding their patterns. Um, I like information, so it, it's fun for me, but just to see where they're going on the website, right? Um, what they're reading, what articles they're clicking on. Um, and then even our social media, just to know, you know, it's okay. I don't have to only post it on my personal page. I can post on our restaurant pages on what we're doing and why it matters. Um, and I think at some point we just had to become brave enough to make the choice to say what we really want and what we stand for. Mm. And there's always some pushback. Yeah. Anytime yeah. you're doing anything yeah. right, there's pushback. There's pushback. Yeah. The food and beverage industry is one of the most trusted industries in the country, right? And part of it is like if you're eating something that <laughs> someone is cooking for you, there you need to trust them, right? right? Um, right. How can that be? F how can chefs who may not even necessarily be aware of that power truly harness it? What is the? H how do you translate that trust into change? I'm By implement the. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. By implement knowledge, for example, when. Um, we beginning to sell wine, right? And then we have that opportunity. So we um, invite our servers to take sommelier classes mm -hmm. in our own restaurant. So then it got to be two, three, four, five people. And then pretty soon they got their first um, level of sommelier, and then their second level. And now we have few of them. So when the customer they know already is coming, he said, oh, there is Rick, you know, he loves Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, mm -hmm. Merlot or uh, Rosette. So they have the opportunity to sell, make that sale, and also perhaps they can, you know, take a case of wine uh, home with them. Her. And when it comes to the food, the more you knowledge about what you cook, I think we here after all to please our customers. And uh, what we want is then, you know, to return and give us the opportunity to work, you know, the, le the letter to where we need to be. And uh, I think that's very valuable. Yeah, yeah I, was, uh, well, I was saying, like, inside out. I think a lot of times when we're thinking about making change, the thought process is always got to go to the top. Mm -hmm. I got to get the head person. Mm -hmm. But if you can change it on your street, change it in your neighborhood, changing your part of the city, changing your part of the state, you can kind of keep going, you'll get to a place to where not only do you actually have access to the people who can make change locally, they have access to the people who can make change in their community too. So you kind of build this um, web of people as you kind of start building out from, uh, from whatever your center is to where you got all these people involved and now it's just not just you going to the top. It's a collective of people all connected going to the top and having their conversation from the top. So it's kind of like we was talking about earlier, just do it, man. Do it and start local and keep building out and you'll get to where you're trying to get to. I think there's a really important part of what you said there that um, the legislators will change things as the community's yes. desires change, <laughs> okay? And I feel like that that's been one of our focuses is to change these people that come. We have, we have an opportunity to, to feed so many people. And when I say feed, I don't just mean the food that's on the plate. We can teach them about local food. We can teach them about policy. We can teach them about all kinds of things. But it really starts 
with the investment in our staff. And I think we all do it naturally, like offering some OEA classes. It's like you just think, oh, they need to have that. So you start doing it. But it's all the education of the staff because they then very much are the, advers uh, the people that are going to be out there advocating for us to the guests. And I would say we, our goal is to seduce people with flavor. And once, once they're like in the palm of our hand, we can tell them all kinds of things. So it's like that, that, that food's got to be like really good and they have to go, whoa, you know, they have to stop talking at the table and go, wow, this is really good stuff. And then they say that to the server and the server tells them why it's so good. Right. Yeah. But it's all yeah. about that kind of education mm -hmm. that sort of leaks down through our staff to all the people that we feed every day. I found it important not only to do like our food training and, and our wine training, but in a way life training, right? Yeah. So we do um, financial advising classes yeah. for our employees, yeah. right? And understanding that, you know, we're not at a place where I remember, you know, six years ago, we didn't have insurance, right? And we worked toward that and we got it now. But we don't have 401k for mm -hmm. our employees right now. And what can you be doing right now to get yourself together, right? So that's when we bring in people and we're talking, all right, this is Roth IRA, this is IRA, this is investment, this is the stocks and bonds. These are things that you could be doing starting now, putting away $50, right? And just that understanding, because so many people who work with us don't have someone else teaching them about the importance of budgeting, right? Like they're, they don't know how much money they make and how much is going out. And starting with those small goals, um, I think is important not only for your business, but for the people who work for you and work with you. And then they take that and they're, they're teaching their people. And so it's, it's so much bigger than just putting Absolutely. food on a plate, right? Absolutely. We should be making sure that it's inclusive in many different ways. Let's finish with a couple of rapid fires. Oh, so buddy, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Might not be that rapid. <laughs> so, I always get scared. <laughs> <laughs> we're celebrating 10 years of boot camp, and you know, what you guys were mentioning, uh, when you went into boot camp, you didn't necessarily understand what you could do with the power that you have as chefs. So uh, now there is, especially after the last two years, there's a greater understanding in the industry in general that you can do a lot more. So. What, can boot, what should bootcamp be for the next 10 years? What is the next stage of that? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, man, that's a good question. Rapid. I gotta think about this for a while. I will just start by saying that there's not enough chefs that have been to boot camp just the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> that I think all of us experience something really profound that just needs to be available to a lot more chefs because with that experience, they will change in ways that will we will we will resonate in their communities. So I don't know if there needs to be something change in it because it was a really remarkable experience for me. I uh, I really I really really love meeting people from a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. um, but from a, from a policy perspective, I would have loved to have been in the boot camp with Katie because we're in North Carolina. We go through a lot of the same things. So. I don't know if there's a mini boot camp the way we can have like a hey North Carolina like a state boot camp because when we go to our local leaders we're all kind of together learning different things but if I can learn hey North Carolina stuff with a North Carolina representative with people in North Carolina who nice. already know what we need to do I think that'd be super dope and even if it was just like a day thing and not necessarily going to wherever but I think that'd be great for us because we can really dig in together as a team and a local community to do some stuff. Give the opportunity to my coworkers who along, I really um, think along the same line this week, like giving the opportunity to them to understand, you know, that there's more of cooking, you know, it's like uh, setting the table for them to, to become, I don't know, maybe the, James, the next James Beer or something like yeah. that. <laughs> so um, I think it's very important to show them the path you know, and, and bring that along and weave all those wonderful things. Loved every minute of, of boot camp, even though, you know, I was tired of sitting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think maybe a second level to it as well, or a continuance in some way for those that have 
gotten started and maybe those who did it many years ago and uh, maybe a refresher course. And then also, you know, setting up those meetings and keeping everyone engaged um, in their in their local areas. And also like sharing, you know, a lot has happened and changed in, a, in the past couple of years. So I think even just gathering from people, hey, what are the issues or things that you're most concerned about right now? Like I find one of the hindrances in the beginning of the pandemic of advocating for change was just because you don't want to say when you're failing, mm -hmm. right? Like you don't want to open up and be like, I'm about to close all of this down. Mm -hmm. But when you understand that if you are feeling that as a restaurant, what I started to understand is if I'm feeling this way, hundreds of thousands of other <laughs> yeah. independent yeah. restaurants yeah. are feeling <laughs> the same way or having a similar struggle that's related to whatever issue that we're handling on. So how do we open up about all of those things to solve the issues one at a time? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. The thousands of issues, <laughs> one at a time. <laughs> but I do think a reset, Absolutely. basically, a reset of like, yeah. what is, where are we at today? Mm -hmm. what, where are we going? What's, mm -hmm. what's happening? At the most recent boot camp, we were talking about the importance of not being overwhelmed by the enormousness of everything mm -hmm. but really like what is the one step you can take today yeah. and the right. one tomorrow and all these things and it's okay if change is small as For long sure. as it happens yeah, right yeah. and to give yourself the grace yes. of patience yeah. it's the only way that change happens mm -hmm. is one little step mm -hmm. at a time and you know when you look up in a couple of years you'll say wow look how far i've come mm -hmm. yeah. could we get the grace of patience put on a shirt somewhere I need to hear that. Mm -hmm. Well, we may have some people around here who can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, last question. Um, for the next generation of boot campers, we're about to open applications for the next one uh, in a couple of weeks. What do you tell them? What is the one piece of advice you would tell someone who will be at the next boot camp? Ask a lot of questions. Ask a lot of questions. Yes, definitely. You know, Don't not be afraid to go as yourself. Like a lot of people, it's like, oh, I'm going to boot camp, I got to be something. Nah, be yourself. It'll work. Don't go with preconceived mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. Go with an open mind. I mean, y'all just said two of the ones in my head. Be mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. Definitely ask questions. But also, it's okay to not know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Almost everyone sitting at that That's table true. with That's you exactly. has no clue as well. <laughs> Some are just looking like they know, you know? <laughs> so it's okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and uh, think about what thing resonates most with you. It doesn't have to be the things that other people are talking about at the boot camp. It's finding that, that thing that connects with you that oftentimes has to do with our upbringing and so many mm -hmm. other parts of our individuality. Thank you all so very much. You embody change, you embody leadership, you embody excellence in so many ways, and it's such an honor that you also are boot camp alums. Mm -hmm. So thank you, yes, yes, thank yes, you very yes. much.